Let's talk about what we're going to talk about today, and that's storytelling. We've already heard stories today. Stories are part of our lore. We pass stories along like we pass history along. That is as important to it as we can get. Story comes in many, many forms. You are all, I'm assuming, are all visual storytellers. And with that, you know, if you go back in history, visual storytelling was the Petroglyphs. Hey, you go out and you look at cave drawings. That tells you a story, right? And today we can look at graphic novels as the visual storytelling medium. Then there's the narrative storytelling. And that is what a lot of these individuals on this panel do. They're writers and creators. But, but narrative storytelling is what we hear on podcasts, right? True crime, other fiction on podcasts. It's also books. It's magazines. It's the printed form. It's a different kind of, of narrative. Then we have the combination. And this is obvious. And we see it in animation. But it's live action features. It is television. It is what we see on YouTube. It is TikTok. It is Instagram. These are all stories. And a good story starts with a beginning, a middle, and an end. So on that note, I would like to get our creative panel, which are creators, storytellers, writers, and producers, to explore this. Um, I'm going to be brief with their introductions, because each one of them, one has a story, the other three have the visuals, and because you are a visual audience, visual is going to be very important for you. Uh, and I'll let them tell their bios. But let me go down the list. And what I'm going to do is I will do a brief introduction. They'll get up, the individual will get up, and will present. So, Jay Facuto, I have to do disclosures, by the way. There's some major disclosures. Jay actually lives two doors from my house. <laughs> <laughs> Jay has been involved in all forms of programming and development at Paramount. Television Pictures Network at, I said that wrong, Paramount Close Pictures enough. Network Television, Walt Disney Television, MGM, Film Roman, and right now he is also doing some independent producing and he's also teaching at the um, Los yeah. Angeles Film School. So Jay, you want to show your? Sure. Uh, and you can I've tell more it. about what you do because you've worked on some major important films. Good morning, pictures. everybody. Everybody hear me? Yeah, I, I need these one, one of these at home. My wife can never hear me. So. <laughs> um, good morning. Uh, so as Jan said, I've, I've been in the business um, a fairly long time, going predating even Jan. I started off um, working sitcoms at Paramount back in the 80s. I've worked on Happy Days, the Laverne and Shirley, and Family Ties. I, I, for six years, I worked for a company called Ubu Productions, Sit Ubu Sit. I was uh, working at the TV company. And around 92, uh, I got involved in animation, at Walt Disney TV animation as their head of current programs. And, and once I got into animation, I'd worked in live action for 10 years. And once I got into animation, I said, this is where I want to stay for the rest of my career. Uh, and not that I um, was a big animation or comic book guy growing up, but just the whole process of working in animation, the whole community of artists and, and creative people in animation, I just took to it so well. I said, I am not going back. This is where I want to stay. And I've been very fortunate in my career. I worked at Disney uh, for seven years altogether. I was the head of MGM Animation for two years. Worked at Film Roma. And Film Roma was a great experience for me because it really enhanced my IMDB page because I was an executive producer on The Simpsons, King of the Hill. We produced Beavis and Butthead. I produced movies with Electronic Arts. Um, I produced a movie with Rob Zombie, uh, an R-rated animated movie with Rob Zombie. So very eclectic. Um, since then, I've, I've gone into independent production. Um, in uh, 2014, 2017, I was uh, developing a movie with Paul McCartney, which was like going to the moon. Like, that experience is beyond anything I can describe. And, uh, and still working on independent productions. Um, and as Jan mentioned earlier this year, I started teaching at the LA Film School in the animation department. The next person I want to introduce is Rita Street. Now, Rita and I go back. Let's put it this way. Another disclosure. I have to give disclosures. Rita is the founder of Women in Animation. I am one of the... I was one of the sergeant-in-arms. 
President Emeritus. Par President Emeritus for 19 and a half years. Um, but Rita, we're celebrating Women in Animation's 30th anniversary. Yes. Yes. And when I met Rita, she was with Animation Magazine as the editor publisher, and she gave it all up to become a producer, creator, writer, and has had several successes, including Hero 108 and Oh, wait till you see 100% Wolf and Ruby Gloom. So, Rita, you take hey. it away and oh. show your stuff. Well, Jay, do you mind playing? This is a little uh, Angry Bird short. <laughs> oh, hey! <laughs> oh. <laughs> oi, oi. Hi, Beth. Hi, Hi, Sweet. That was um, from a studio in Lima, Peru, called Red Animation Studios, which is a partner of mine. Um, and I wrote that. So um, I brought it, though, because magic and storytelling, um, I, just, I, I just love the power of animation to transform. I mean, I, I, I came out of a theater background, and I was always drawn to, like, Dottist or surrealist theater. And then when I moved into animation, I was like, oh my God, we can do everything. This is amazing. <laughs> so um, it was just like a miracle. Animation was like a fulfillment of every dream I ever had because you literally, anything in the dreamscape, anything through the looking glass, anything that um, becomes something else that you've ever imagined, you can do it in animation. Um, so that's why I brought that, because I thought it was like a little bit of magic and storytelling. Um, and so I feel like I've had kind of a little magic in my life to be able to be in animation. And uh, I've been fortunate enough to get some shows, a lot of shows off the ground as an independent and as an executive producer. So basically, I, like I match make, I like go, oh, I like your design. Let's put you together with a storyteller and then let's do this thing. And we're going to sell it to other people who have lots of money that we don't have. So um, and occasionally it actually works. So, um, yeah, I got my first show off the ground, Ruby Gloom, about 20 years ago. And I am, if you're a Ruby Gloom fan at all, I'm working with the creator, Stacy Brand, and we are aging her up and making her a teenager in a um, kind of a Halloween horror through the looking glass story. So that's what I'm going to be out pitching next year. Um, but other shows that I've had, like on Cartoon Network, I had Hero 108. I had my first movie come out during the pandemic, which was a bummer. But it did really well. It was a movie called 100% uh, Wolf, and we're in production on 200% Wolf. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> but uh, it's a story of a, a young kid who uh, comes from a long line of famous werewolves, and it's his big night to transwolf Tate, and he steps out into the moonlight, and he turns into a poodle. <laughs> so he's on the lamb, because wolves don't like dogs, so that's kind of the premise that he can go back and forth from human to poodle to wolf. Um, so uh, other things is I've just helped secretly behind the scenes dozens of companies and studios help develop their shows and try to get them off the ground or I'm kind of a secret fix it person. So um, I think that's that's kind of it for me and it's your turn. No, I have one more oh. thing to say because okay. she didn't give me a, a digital. Oh yeah. You, Thank you. Rita has this is a free ebook. Go to radarcartoons.com. This is called the Cartoon Girl's Secret Guide to Developing Kids Comedy Series That Sell. And I'm telling you, it is, I had to proofread it. It is actually a very fun book. It's very short, but you'll learn a lot about storytelling. So there get it. Oh, thanks, you Jen. Need, wow. You need, you need to do, uh, Buying you dinner. All right, so we've got at the end of our table is Bonnie Balgam. Now, I have another disclosure. I'm full of disclosures today. Uh, Bonnie and I met, what, in 2004, I think it was, at Rhythm and Hughes, which is a visual effects company, and, um, and they did Life of Pi. You might remember that movie. Uh, they also did Babe. And Bonnie is responsible for setting up uh, uh, the Rhythm and Hughes studios in India, Malaysia, and where else? Where am I missing? few other places. Taiwan. Taiwan. Uh, but since then, Bonnie has become a creator, writer, filmmaker. Creator, writer, and filmmaker. Whoops, as we have technical issues here. Um, of preschool entertainment and also of short live action films. And I don't know what she's going to show you today. There we go. And Bonnie, take it away. Hello, everyone. Oh, here, you need this. I don't know why they keep putting it in front of me. It's not loud enough. Hello, can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yeah, come back. What's going on? I'll give you. Hello, can you hear me now? There we go. Hi, good morning. <laughs> I got it. Yeah. Um, my beautiful long Indian name is Saraswati, which literally translates to the goddess of education and art. <laughs> I think my parents expected too much out of me. Uh, too ambitious, those parents, I tell you. Um, but I'm a brat, so my mother couldn't scold me with that name. So I ended up becoming Vani, which is V-A-N-I. So I'm always a brat and I intend to stay that way. Um, I'm just gonna... So I love breaking boxes because um, that's the one thing I'm getting good at, I think. I started, um, I grew up in India and I was always told no as a woman to be a director. Every time I went and said, this is what I want to be, they would say no. Uh, you're good at producing, you're good at something else, you're good at marketing, blah, blah, blah. Uh, it was a very hard place for me, but I'm going to talk about all of that later. But here is what I'm doing right now. Um, I sold my house uh, to do what I do because nobody wants to invest in a brown woman. Uh, and so I said, you know what, I'm going to invest in me because I live once. So here you go. Well, any ideas? Ah, why don't we call Ganu? Right! Ganu! Ganu! Hmm?
<laughs> also, Vani took women in animation to India. She was the president of Asifa uh, India, so she's been very much involved in everything. So, you know, all my disclosures. I have one last disclosure. <laughs> it's Chris. You heard about him. Guess yeah. what? I met him for the first time today. <laughs> not your neighbor. I'm not your neighbor. <laughs> <laughs> Citizens of the world, right? Chris, Chris is a director, and you would know him best for uh, Cloudy with a Chance on Meatballs, and he did Netflix Willoughby's, and I'm going to let him talk about himself. And one thing you should know about directors and animation is you need like 200 people to keep them in order. And I forgot to bring a visual, so I'm going to be yeah. the visual today. <laughs> um, but I grew up on a farm in Ontario, and I was uh, always into comics and went to Sheridan College and came out at a time when we were still drawing on paper. So I uh, worked at Fox, and that was going to last forever because I love animating and then it didn't. <laughs> and so then I ended up kind of moving into story because that was a way to kind of you know, still be an actor in a world where a lot of that animation wasn't happening in North America. So uh, from there, I went, uh, was a story artist for years doing TV stuff and then ended up at Sony and was there kind of at the beginning, worked on all their movies, uh, uh, ended up at Aardman and then worked and did some live action, worked on a Star Wars movie, was, was a locksmith, kind of bounced around everywhere. Now I'm back at Sony in development. So I've got a uh, bunch of projects going and I can't talk about any of them. So I'm gonna tell you a story, okay? <laughs> and maybe this story will tee off our conversation. So uh, one of my favorite stories is, it was told to me as an old Irish folk tale. So uh, if you've been to Ireland, it rains and it gets dark at like three o'clock in the afternoon because it's pretty far north, right? So it's, it's raining and it's getting cold and it's dark and there's this wizened old man and he's kind of cute. You know how old men kind of look like babies? You know, he's kind of all bundled up. He's a, an old wanderer with a big gnarly stick and he's walking down this dirt road and he's been walking all day and, and you know, people in Ireland in the old days would just walk from one side to the other and then turn around and walk back. So, you know, generally, you know, you just kind of, you know, when it gets cold and wet, you find a place to crash. So he goes and knocks on the door. Door opens. They take one look at him and then go, oh, and they slam the door shut. And he goes, huh. Oh. He goes to the next house and knocks on the door and they open it up and they see him and they slam the door shut. He goes to the third house, same thing happens. And he's like, what the fuck's wrong with these people? <laughs> um, you know, he's sitting there in the rain and he's just, you know, maybe I'll just hide under a bush or whatever. And then a young guy comes by. He's got a big beard and he's got, a, he's got the same stick, but it's like, you know, it's not as gnarled and you know, he's got a little jaunt in his step. And he walks up and the old guy's like, don't even bother. I mean, if you want, I mean, maybe you and me can walk to the next town because these people, they won't let you in. And he's like, oh. Well, hey, let's we'll just give it a try. So he walks up to the first door, knocks on it. Second, they open it. Yeah, he goes in, door slams shut, and the old guy's like, what the? What? I'm old. He's sitting out there, and he's feeling really bad, kind of questioning life decisions, and then the door opens, and it's the guy with the young guy, and he waves him in. And the old guy walks into the house, and the door closed. And the metaphor is the old guy represents truth. And the young guy represents story. The way to get truth in, tell a story. So that's kind of what we do. <laughs> and that is from a visual storyteller. Well, let's get it. I guess I have to do this. Let's get into our discussion. And this is going to be a discussion. And if any of you have a question, we're going to have Q&A at the end. But you know what? I run my, my own show. You can stand up and ask a question. What the heck, right? right. Sure. We want to have a dialogue. We don't want to have a Q&A. So the first question I have for the entire panel is, what, in your opinion, makes a story truly magical and unforgettable? Anybody want to grab that one? Come on, Chris. Uh, I mean, I think it's always character. I mean, if um, if if you know, there's a metaphor happening on the screen that I can relate to and that I can connect with those, the journey of the, of the character's motivations, the character's arc, the character change, it reflects back in, in terms of my own experience. So, um, I don't know, for me it's like, you know, uh, if you haven't seen Harold and Maude, watch it and then watch it again and then watch it again. And every time you'll watch it, you'll cry more. And I think it's because it's just such a beautiful example of, you know, what we need in this world, which is humanity and kindness. But 
I think whatever you're looking for, that's what the movie should give you. This is exactly what I was going to say. In prepping for this, the question was, what's 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 um, uh, magical and unforgettable? It's always the character, and and where it starts with me in, in my training in television. I remember back uh, when I was uh, working at uh, at Uber Productions, and we had a an output deal with NBC. So I was with the higher ups at NBC uh, on a on a day to day weekly basis. Brandon Tartikoff, a sort of legendary head of programming at NBC. Warren Littlefield, Perry Simon. And I remember one time we were in um, Brandon's office uh, at NBC when they were still in Burbank. And um, uh, at the time, NBC was on the top of the mountain. They had this sort of, I don't know if any of you are old enough, but on Thursday night, they sort of ruled the world in terms of television. And this is this is before streaming. This is, this is before cable, honestly. But NBC on Thursday nights, they had like half the country watching um, their, their line of shows, The Cosby Show, Us, Family Ties, Cheers, Night Court. And I remember being in Brandon's office and he was, he was just talking about his philosophy. And he said that in terms of what, being a program and the shows he looked for, he always he, he was trying to find characters that people would, would invite, would like to have in their home every week. You know, people that, that, that you're comfortable having your own, like guests, but, but people that you emulate, people that you want, that you want to be like, people that you like, and role models, people that you look up to and you want to, you want to, you know, patting your life after them. So character is, is everything as far as I'm concerned in terms of the magical, unforgettable elements of, uh, of any piece of entertainment. Is there a Bill Cosby joke there or is it too soon? What's that? <laughs> <You're doing> that. <laughs> yeah, I don't want him in my house. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I have a, the interesting thing for me is I was at MGM. I got to know Bill Cosby very well. Wow. The, the experience of Bill Cosby is, I won't get into that. It's just a different conversation, but it's, it's very complicated for me because I, I worked on a movie with him for two years and um, and I saw a very different side from what people see. And, and this was at the time when all this was happening too. So anyway, it, it, it's, ve- it's, it's a very complicated story. It's, it's a very story. complicated thing for me. So. Sorry. <laughs> no. <laughs> I was just going to, okay, I totally agree with the character. But I've sat on more pitch festivals as a juror and coached more artists on how to make a great concept. I mean, to get their concept over the line. And yes, it is always character, but this is how everybody pitches their stories. Mm -hmm. They say, once upon a time in a galaxy far, far away, there was this blah, 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 and there was this rebel force, and there was, everybody starts their pitches without the character in mind. So I I think the danger for young storytellers, unless you've been hit time and time again with buyers saying, you know, you start out your pitch in the buyer's meeting at Cartoon Network just like that, and they go, where's the character? Where's the story? We got the story. We got that it's a science fiction epic that you're going to tell us, but we don't care. We only care about the character. So it's a tricky thing when you're developing a show because the one character that's the most hard to describe and get your hooks into is Luke Skywalker. Think about it. He's like, Han Solo is so much more interesting, (laughs) but Luke goes on a journey. So For television especially, when you don't rely on a hero's journey except within the course of each episode, you have to be able to describe your character as if they were your best friend or as if they were someone that you want to aspire to be like, and how do you do that? You have to know that character so well that they are a member of your family. You can just rattle off all these details and all these anecdotes of like, oh, and then the time when the character did this, oh my God, almost got in jail. It was crazy. <laughs> anyway. But you think about Luke Skywalker. I mean, if you were to pitch him, it's like a young farm boy discovers he's got a magical wizard warrior skill and saves the universe from a bad guy. It's kind of like, it is kind of a big story like, for him. You know, he's kind of boring because of like, he has to run the middle line, but right, like, the right. pitch it's on that, him is yeah, yeah, the, the story of him is fantastic, but yeah. if you had to describe his personality, yeah. that's tough. That's on, that's on, that's on, yeah. <laughs> I mean, All of that, of course. Um, For me, what I have learned as a person that has learned film by myself, um, when I write my stuff, the hardest part where the magic happens is where the character has to make a choice. 
And I think that for me is where the magic happens because I'm now madly, deeply in love with what's going to happen next because I'm cheering for the character. I'm cheering for that person's journey. And um, so many times I'm making as a writer the wrong choices of what is that thing that's going to happen. So all film is just coming to that point of the concept, but the choice, the, the hard choice of what they're going to do. And I think that's about it. I remember as a very young girl watching uh, Bambi and uh, Thumper, who is um, in the film, has to say, laughs at Bambi because Bambi falls down. And, and the mother says, what did I tell you? It says, if you can't be good, don't be, if you can't say something good, don't say anything at all. And that's a choice that Thumper had to make. Like, you know, he had to say that. And you, that, those moments of those characters become so remarkable for us. It's that choice making. Um, so I think it's, as, as they all said, it's definitely the journey, the concept, the overall thing. But um, for me, it's, oh my God, they're going to do that. And that's awesome. Can I just say one more thing about what you, you reminded me that that's one of the greatest things I love about animation is, um, well, I, and I learned it in theater, actually, because I, I, not that I was any good at this, but I was in an improv group. And I got to tell you, that's really great for artists and actors and writers, because everybody should, do everybody everybody should take should an improv that. class. I know, yes. it's like kill me now. But, <laughs> but the one thing yes, you yeah. learn is to think in opposites. Like, okay, we started talking about grapefruits. Now, what would be the absolute opposite of a grapefruit? Cement. Cement. Okay, so there, there, that's our, and those are our choices. And then going with that absurdity and making it okay is the thing that makes storytelling fantastic, especially in cartoons. I'm building my house out of grapefruit. Yeah. 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 Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, speaking of that, and building houses out of grapefruit, storytelling is a really powerful social change medium, correct? Um, how can creators, who are looking at characters, or looking at environments, or looking at situations, how can they create a cra uh, craft, create, oh, I'm kind of trying to put two words together, um, important social issues? into their storytelling because we need to look at a story that moves forward we need a story that has the beginning middle and end whether it's a sitcom or whether it's a feature film it's all in three acts how do we integrate those kinds of social uh, aspects into it to keep the story moving this social i mean well oh, I, social change aspects like, we're talking about diversity Inclusion. I mean, jumping back a few years, uh, when we were working on the first Cloudy, uh, certainly there was like these themes of consumption, and one of the big themes of the film was like bigger isn't always better. And we were, while we were building the film, uh, you know, spending a lot of time just watching, you know, like was it Super Size Me, like all that, like all that kind of stuff about like how unhealthy the sad diet is, the standard American diet, and the idea of like, uh, you know. <sighs> how unhealthy it is in terms of just that constant need for growth and that constant need for bigger, bigger, bigger. However, the movie's not gonna be presented in that way. So when I, when I told that story about, like, you know, truth is delivered through a uh, story, like the metaphor, you have to kind of pull that metaphor up. Um, and so like, I think it's important to know what you're trying to say and what you want to say and how you wanna, why, why make this movie now and then figure out how to, bury it within the metaphor in a way that it doesn't like go away, but it becomes palatable. It's like swallowing a pill. You want to be able to put the medicine that tastes bitter into the pill. And the other side of that is like, it's more interesting to me as a filmmaker to start a conversation rather than present, this is the way it is, because there's always two sides and many sides to the truth. If you get your audience to think, then you get into a place where the, like, hopefully you start a conversation. So, yeah. And so like the second cloudy was, you know, who owns food and that kind of 
termed me vegetarian for many years and I kind of fell off the wagon but like I, I but I do think like and and like we were there was a lot about Willoughby's that I was thinking about colonialism in terms of like how do you process your legacy and how do you move forward from a past that has a lot of you know damaging stuff all through the point of view of these four kids that were trying to murder their parents and so the idea of like the parents aren't the answer and and it's really the next generation I, and I, I think that whole time I was thinking of climate change I'm thinking of like you know building walls to keep other people out like that was happening in 2016 so but when you watch the movie I hope you don't think it in an overt way but it starts to kind of sit into your 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 exactly. yeah your juices that's why like a good movie you can watch four or five times hopefully and met like a hundred times and sort of find these metaphors so I'll stop talking. we have a question back there let's uh, no you okay. in the, oh, okay, sure. <laughs> with the hand up <laughs> yeah with the hand up <laughs> Like the question I had earlier was saying, do uh, you guys think about purpose in your story development first, or does that come later? Like, you know, your through line, like the lesson that you were talking about, like, yeah. you know, do, uh, consumption figures not always better. Do you think about that first besides the character, or do you think about that like after the world building and everything else is done? Did you all get that? Did you hear it? Good. I don't want to dominate, but <laughs> I mean, uh, short answer is actually yes, because um, I, I always think like you were talking about pitching, right? You, you, you're always pitching, right? So when you when you come into an idea, like usually I try to digest the idea, and I come up with like I call it the hook. What's your hook? You know, what's the story really about? And sometimes that'll evolve and change, but usually it doesn't. And then everything that happens around it is all about how do you. How do you illustrate it? How do you how do you turn the hook into a metaphor? For me. Yes. Yeah. Uh, totally. Um, I wanted to also add that. So a lot of people come to me for consultations on like, I've got this great idea, and I can't tell you how many times I have heard. And no offense, but I've got this preschool show. And it's all about recycling, and we're going to save the planet. <laughs> and I, it's my life's mission, and I've put everything on this, and this is going to be the thing. And you, I'm like, but, well, who's the character? <laughs> and why should we love this character? And she's like, no, 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 no. It's the, we must have the mission at the forefront. And I'm like, you know, cartoons are okay if they just make kids laugh. It's like, that's a mission. But it, I, the mission can destroy you. Mm -hmm. So as you were saying, keep the pill in a sweet package, <laughs> like put it in a bar of Snickers. So don't let the mission destroy your idea. So that, that was my main point. I, I think for me, and I agree with everything that uh, Chris and Rita said. I think that it's really incumbent upon uh, creative people such as us and all of you um, to be responsible in terms of the kind of stories and the way we tell our stories. I mean, I know that whenever I'm developing uh, an idea um, in collaboration with uh, you know, a talented director like Chris and talented writer like Rita, um, we really, I really try to keep a view of, of the world. I don't, I, I, we don't want to present something that's just sort of a, ma a white male dominated point of view that makes sure that it's inclusive of, of everybody. And whether it's gender, um, whether it's sexual orientation, you know, make sure everybody's included. And one of the things that, that I, I know that um, uh, whenever some, early on when you included a gay character or or a character of color, you kind of put a spotlight on the character and everything they said would reflect who they were. And I think that's, that's going too far because we live in a world where we are ourselves and we're mm -hmm. among people that uh, you know, have uh, disabilities or have uh, um, a, a different, different sexual orientation, but it doesn't matter because, because we're all, all the same. And the fact that we represent people in sort of a clear, truthful way without putting a spotlight on something. And every time they open their mouth, it's like, you know, this is who I am. No, we, we sort of all work together um, as, um, as a group that uh, sort of 
uh, takes into account who we are and accepts that. And I think, again, for me, when I'm, whenever I'm developing characters, I'm looking at a lineup, I make sure that that re reflect the world as, 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 as we live in, as I experience it. Um, for me, I, I mean, there are a couple of things that we're touching upon, but the first thing to answer in terms of um, our purpose, um, I personally like to use the six, the, the six things, which is what, why, where, when, how, and who. If I don't have answers for that, and if they're not strong enough in my storytelling, I will talk to a hundred people and beg them to make my story better. Uh, purpose is a very important thing, like everybody said. If you're talking about climate change, if you're talking about you know, eating too much, whatever the, the, the subtle things that you're talking about needs to also be extremely entertaining. Mm -hmm. You know, because at the end of the day, this is all about entertainment with a pinch of something. Um, so I've heard it, I've, I've learned it the hard way that you know, when you go with that intensity that this is the film that I want to make about this, you know, girl children in India being killed even before they're born because there is this gender problem in India. And I can't pitch that that way, even though I might be extremely passionate about it and it's killing me inside to tell that story. I have to figure out a way that the audience will get it and it'll hit them when it needs to hit them in the story, in the writing, not throughout the entire film, they'll be like, oh no. And they automatically empathize with it. So I feel purpose is a very important thing. Um, in terms of uh, voices in filmmaking, I think with the current generation and the availability of technology, um, a lot of voices will be heard. Um, and they will be brought forward, which I don't think existed for the last 50, 60 years in the mainstream Hollywood industry. Uh, they were stereotyped Indians, they were stereotyped people from different parts of the world. And that was cool because that was their perspective. But with the internet, with TikTok, with uh, you know, YouTube shorts, you get to see a lot of the cute little things that you know that they are not to be stereotyped as we move forward. So I hope as future creators and writers and filmmakers that you will make sure that you partner with the right people. So if you're writing about somebody from Philippines, you know, talk to somebody from Philippines. If you're talking about somebody from India, talk to somebody from India and bring those consultants into your writing so that, that you bring the authenticity, which is absolutely lacking in the today's industry. But it's getting there. Do you mind if I, I jump on this? Yes, please. Yeah, because I, I think that what you said the word passion and authenticity. I think that's really important to pay attention to, too. Like, tell, like, the, there's stories that you can tell that I can't tell, that you can tell, that you can't tell. Like, you, like we all have our own stories. Right. And I think, you, you know, the important thing is to kind of understand that that passion is something you can trust. So when you start sharing it with six, eight, 10, 12, 14 other people and you start getting feedback, you can listen to that feedback and you can adjust your pitch. And ultimately you wanna harness that passion, activate it to sell your characters and, and that make money. Make money. <laughs> well, but, but also like spread the message. I mean, like the only reason we're doing this is for an audience. Like we, and, and I think that's the really important thing. That's the urgent thing. We need, we need a different voices to, to. I just wanna add one more thing just because he said the word audience. Um, I got the greatest lesson just a week ago. <laughs> And I was pitching a short to someone very big back in India. And I was like, hey, this is why I'm making this film. And after he heard my entire pitch, he said, I don't care why you're making this film. And I was like, what? Uh, what do you mean? And he's like, the audience doesn't care why you're making this film. And, and I was like, are you sure? And the way, I mean, the, the, in the sense, in the sense that the audience is putting all their energy, their attention, their money to not worry about your baggage. You know what I mean? They are not interested in, did I lose a child? They're interested in the truth of the story and the journey of the character. So as an indie filmmaker, I'm always trying to say, oh, I'm doing this because of this. And it is true for me, but not for the audience. It's not their story. So that's a great takeaway in terms of like 
tell the truth that the audience wants to know. Well, you'll be there if right. it's true, right? Like, you know what I mean? Like, it's just, yeah. yeah. Can I just really quickly give one more example? Oh, please. I mean, that, we're a discussion. We're not. I, the Kind of the weird exception to this rule is when you're purposely trying to give a message when it, um, and it is meant to change people entirely. I have gotten to write several shorts for the Barbara Sinatra Foundation um, for children. And one of the most successful ones is one called Is Anybody Out There? And it's a beautiful piece that Wonder Media produced. It's the story of a high school girl named Mari who's on the basketball team and she wants to be a scientist and an astronaut. And the coach has been touching her inappropriately. And the short is about how to ask another trusted adult for help in a situation like that. So the reason we did it in animation was to take, it's so difficult to watch a live action piece like that. It's, it's almost too much to take in, right? So this is where animation is so powerful because it, it backs it off one step and yet it makes it even more personal at the same time. And the, the trick we came up with as a team to make it visually compelling was that every time she feels disconnected, she imagines herself in a spacesuit. And you hear that breathing sound that as if she's in the helmet. And you see her kind of floating off into space. And at the last moment, a teacher actually pulls the tether and pulls the spacesuit back from the stars. And he sits her down and says, you're safe, you can talk to me, and we'll, work, we'll go see the counselor together. And so that's an example of actually being in your face with an audience, with a real message, but allowing animation to do its good work for storytelling. How did you find the breathing thing? Was that something that you, like, we, through the making? We made that up, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But it was yeah. like so, Intense. Intense. Yeah. <laughs> the, or even the mask kind of fogs up as she's breathing and everything. Wow. So. We're getting towards the end, and I know there's some questions out there. But before I do that, I just want to go down the uh, down the lane here and ask, what's next for each one of you? Jay, what's next for you? Well, hopefully selling, hopefully selling the show. And as I said, I started teaching, so I'm um, uh, something I always wanted to do and, and engage in that. So that'll probably expand. Uh, but uh, uh, keeping uh, keeping an eye out for other independent projects. Uh, but but uh, as I said, a, a route optimistic about these two that uh, that uh, we're we're out actively. Uh, hopefully, that'll keep me pretty busy for the next few years. Rita, oh my gosh, what's next um, for you? Let's see. Well, redeveloping Ruby Gloom and getting that out there. Fingers crossed. Knock on wood. Yay! Um, oh, and she's back in hot topic. Some new t-shirts and hoodies, so, and dolls, there's new dolls. Um, and then I'm doing the second, writing the second season of a Lithuanian preschool show, which is actually really great. It's called Stomp Stomp Rhinos, and it is another message show. It's um, how to help kids control their anger, anger management, and relieve anger in the moment. And, you know, rhinos get mad, so... <laughs> There's a bunch of little kid rhinos learning real um, steps to relieve anger management. So that and then uh, EPing another movie and just, you know, we're just all scrambling all the time. And, you know, getting older, I'm trying to deal with ageism to <laughs> stay relevant. <laughs> so there you go. That's it. Chris, what's on your docket? I'm in development at Sony and probably, I don't know, uh, training to fight the AI overlords because <laughs> I don't, I don't want to live in that world. So We you know. didn't even get to talk about <laughs> yeah. AI. Bonnie, you've got a whole roster of things you're working on. I have about uh, independently written about seven preschool shows, three feature films uh, in animation and two in live action. So I want all of them made and make a lot of money. Yeah. I've got a couple of short films which I am absolutely sure that I'm going to win an Oscar for. So, hey, let's manifest that. Now, we I, have questions. We only have a few minutes. We really, oh, get up and stand up and talk. And if you want to, we got a mic over there, but just stand up and yell. Uh, hello, everybody. My name is Sammy. Uh, I'm a, a 
and thank you for um, all you said about um, characters and um, purpose and social things in there because um, I actually want to hang out with stuff too. It's like you guys get really, you guys get a lot of stuff in there. Uh, but my question I want to ask you um, so for me, one of the things that really got me into storytelling was reading um, Joseph Campbell's Hero of the Occupation yeah. in high school. And it was like, oh, stories have more meanings than just like laughing and all that stuff. Um, but, and since then, um, I've been studying like how that book has influenced like, the film industry and other things of that nature. And so I guess what I want to ask you guys, like, do you, because like, do you guys think that book is still relevant and should be used? Like how it, it tells stories and like how people have like <laughs> derived from that book? Or do you think there might be like a new way of storytelling? I taught from that book. I taught story storytelling at Santa Monica. But Rita, you've got. Oh, and Chris. I'm sure yeah, and Chris, you uh, might. Uh, uh, yes. <laughs> I think that um, the hero's journey will always be relevant because it's, it's intrinsic in our own nature. Like when you see a movie that has a great journey of the hero, you feel like, oh, that's an answer for my life. Like I could go on that same journey and evolve. Um, but it is very strict if you look at it. But I always find that the strictness of the format um, helps me. I like working within a box because once you put me in a box, then I can break it. Like, so it, it's super fun. I also love Save the Cat. I find Save the Cat really valuable. And I always like refer to that even in short making because if you just kind of take the highlights, um, make it twist in the middle and you're good. So I, I totally believe in it. Yeah, I think you're right. And I think, like, look at it as a tool, uh, you know, so it's, and I've been using the story wheel, which I think is like Dan Harmon kind of made it famous, but it's based, based off of, but like, for me, it's like you, you know, you, you start with your idea and you put a lot of stuff down. I believe in, we were talking about this yesterday, sprints. So you put as much down as you can and then walk away from it. And then when you come back, look at it again and then use these tools, whether it's save the cat or the story wheel, like, you know, to sort of test your material. Because sometimes when you get into the middle of telling a story and you say it out loud to an audience, you might start to feel the audience drift. Well, why is that happening? These are, these are troubleshooting tools. And I think the idea of the hero's journey that makes it universal is it goes all the way back to like ancient, you know, Aristotle and you know all the you know the Greeks and the Romans and all that like so this stuff has been around for a long time and it is a very very uh, resonant thing with the human condition but if you just follow the wheel you're gonna make a story that everyone's already seen so you got to find your own version of that but again I think I think it's all valid and whatever works for you works for you and no one as Vani said no one's gonna watch a movie and go wow that director really Really understood Joseph Campbell, really. You know what I mean? And they probably lost a lot of sleep, you know? I think, I think you want to you bury it. But if it's a tool, it makes you smarter, and that's good. Yeah. Um, we only have a few, we only have about four minutes. I don't I mean, know you have structure. Be... You know, it's about giving anything some amount of structure. So I absolutely love all the people that have contributed to filmmaking. Every single one, a good film, a bad film, one must watch all of it to know what's working and, and you know, implement it in your own way to say, what would I do differently? Yes, please. So, um, the main reason why I wanted to come here in particular <laughs> is because I'm working on a book slash story of my own, not writing it, simply in the early development stages. Um, having trouble with the climax, so I came here for inspiration. <laughs> Go back to the beginning. There's kind of like two climaxes. One I've already got figured out, and the other one that comes after that climax is like the thing that the entire story's been building up towards. Like the first climax is what the character arc's been building up towards, and then the second one's what the story and the lore has been building up towards. Um, the story's about a dragon. I need help. I all do when someone help. says I need help. <laughs> I need help on the climax. Um, I, I think really you just said like kind of go back to the beginning. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I actually I've been going through this this past week. So I've been working on a, on a movie and it's been. 
around for a while, so there's a lot of ideas down. So like you say, you have two climaxes, you have all this stuff, but there's something that's not sticking. If you go back to the beginning of the story and start asking, I always ask, and this is very story 101, but what does your character want and what does your character need? And each character should have some, some version of that. Some smaller characters maybe are just one note. But if you start from the beginning of your story through your character's wants and needs, and around the midpoint, you start to shift from want to need. Do you know what I mean by that? Like, you know, like I, I might, I might want a hamburger, but what I need is a salad. Does that make sense? Like, there, yeah. you know, <laughs> I might want to sleep in, but I need to go to the gym because it's going to make me live longer, so I can I, I think, fight the robots. You know, <laughs> so like, I think so. Like, like when 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 you take off plot, so plot is what happens next. Take that away, go back to the beginning and say, my character wants this, that's why they do that. My character wants this, that's why they do that. And then at some point they get what they want and it's like, no, that's not what I want anymore. I need this other thing. That's when you, that's when you put the gauntlet on and you fight for a reason. So I think, I think like, that's where like the story math is good. You kind of go back and, yeah. yeah. Does that make the, sense? The basic idea is yep, that if you think that you have makes a- sense. I think if you have a, you think you have an Act Three issue, you actually have an Act One issue. Yeah, yeah. That's I it. think that's, that's what it comes. Yeah. Back. yeah. So simply think that. Um, I mean, I already, I kind of already know what the, <laughs> what the final <laughs> climax is going to be. It's just. Well, well that's, that's nice, actually. You, if you know where it's going to be, you just got to back I, into it. You got to kind of like get your story to go I there. Just, yeah. it's, it's, there are three challenges. This is the third and final challenge. I cannot figure out what's going to be in that challenge. I want it to be something that's relevant to her needs you know and what? her can I development just, and her art. Sorry, can I just interrupt and just say that another great thing to do is look at stories that are similar to yours and map them out and see how they got to the climax. I think that might be helpful. I, whenever I'm stuck on it, like, um, like I'll, for some reason, I'll always go back to Wizard of Oz. That always helps me. <laughs> but if, but if, if you're, and I'm not talking about genres, I'm talking about story structure. Look at a, a movie or a book that has similar story structure that you want to achieve. Map that out in your own way and see how that was done. That will be helpful. Mm -hmm. All right, that Thank concludes you. our time.